this path that we're following is called the middle way. And it's important that you understand there are two kinds of middle. One is the midpoint on a continuum. Another is a point off the continuum entirely. And the Buddha teaches both kinds of middle, for example, in terms of effort that you put into practice. You know the story of the, the monk with very tender feet. He was doing walking meditation so much that his feet started to bleed and he began to have thoughts of disrobing. The Buddha levitated and appeared right in front of him. Don't you wish you had the Buddha coming to levitate and appear right in front of you while you were meditating? Make it a lot easier. In this particular case, the Buddha asked him, back you were, when you were a layperson, were you skilled at playing the lute? The monk answers, yes. What happened when the string was too tight? Did it sound good? No. When it was too loose? Did it sound right? No. You have to tune the string so it's just right. In the same way the Buddha said, you, you tune your effort, your level of energy you put into the practice, to what you can handle. And then you tune all the other faculties of your practice. In other words, conviction, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, you tune it to the level of effort you can put in. And that way your practice is in tune. It's like tuning a lute. You tune one string first, and then you tune the other strings to that first one. And in this case, it is a matter of a midpoint on a continuum. You can slide up or down the continuum. And that's not all that difficult. Question of how much you push, how much you pull back. There's two directions. But with the other kind of continuum, there are more directions, more dimensions. Take the outfold path. The Buddha teaches it as a midway between sensual indulgence and self-torture. Now, this doesn't mean that you have kind of a middling life where you torture yourself a little bit and have a little bit of pleasure. And the path actually has a very in intense pleasure in it. They are in right concentration, but it's a different kind of pleasure, and you relate to it in a different way than you normally relate to pleasure. To begin with, it's a pleasure that's based not on outside sensory input, not on the pleasures of the senses. It's based simply on the, the ability of the mind to settle down and be still. This is off the continuum of sensual pleasure and sensual pain. Because it's a pleasure that comes simply from inhabiting the form of your body, being with the breath, the breath energy all around the body, all through the body, experiencing it from inside. That's form. And the pleasure that can come as you learn how to direct the energies in the body, finding out where they're flowing well, where they're not flowing well what ways you think about the energies that help them to flow better, where you focus your attention to loosen up the tension. That's a pleasure that doesn't depend on sensu sensory input or sensual input. It's a different kind of pleasure. And as a result, it's a much cl clearer pleasure. In other words, the mind is less intoxicated by it, because you're not harming anybody. The pleasure is where we have to intoxicate ourselves, and we in, it's almost as if the mind intentionally puts blinders on itself. You've probably had the experience of lusting after somebody, and if you step back and looked at it, the lust, you realize you're focusing only on a few things, and a certain narrative which includes a few details but ex excludes an awful lot, because there's an awful lot of oppression that goes on in there that kind of relationship. But we don't like to think about it, so we just block it out. 
is also the whole question of what that person has right under the skin, what you have right under your skin. Is that something really worth lusting for? Again, we block that out. So many of our sensory pleasures are just that, blocked out, narrow, confined range of view. And so they're intoxicating. But the pleasure of concentration isn't intoxicating that way. You can get attached to it, but it's putting you in a position where you can see the attachment clearly and learn to let go. But notice, it's off the, the spectrum. It's off that continuum. It's not halfway between sensual pleasure and, and sensual pain. It's something of a different order entirely. And the way you relate to it is different as well. This is important. We tend to simply receive, as they say in Thai. Rap is the word in Thai. We're on the receiving end of the pleasure. We're on the receiving end of the pain. We're the ones who are being afflicted by the pain. We're the ones who are allowed to enjoy the pleasure. That puts us on the passive side. When it's pain, it's we're the victim. When it's pleasure, we're the person enjoying the pleasure. We identify ourselves as the, as the taster, as the experiencer. But with a path, that's not the relationship you want to have. You want to learn how to use the pleasure of concentration as a tool. This means as you're able to create a sense of pleasure with the breath, you're not just going to wallow in the pleasure. Because that takes you back to your old ways of just getting very intoxicated with the pleasure. You've got to think of it. This is something I've got to work with. What can I do with this pleasure? First, you can work on areas of tension or tightness in the body. Get yourself into the body. And then you can start asking yourself, well, where am I in the body? What fabrications have you built up around that sense of where you are in the body? You can begin to take these apart. In other words, the pleasure becomes a basis for understanding a lot of the mind's strange perceptions, replacing them with new perceptions, trying out new perceptions. This is how you get off your normal continuum. Ask a different question. Look at things from a different way. Get outside the box. Pleasure is something that you can actually use as a tool rather than something you simply experience or don't experience, that you run after as much as you can, and then when you've got it, just hold on to it. Here we're learning how to be with it, but not just simply grasp at it. We learn to use it. So when the pleasure comes up in the meditation, don't let yourself lose focus. Think of it as something you're going to use as a tool. And then start using it as a tool. This way you develop the mindfulness that keeps you from getting waylaid by the pleasure, carried off by the pleasure. And it becomes part of the path. There's that other interpretation of the middle way where the Buddha talks about saying that the all exists is one extreme, the all doesn't exist is another extreme. He teaches the middle way, dependent core rising. This is another case where the middle way is off the continuum. As he said, most people think in terms of this polarity. Things either exist or they don't exist. The word all here covers all the senses and their objects. Basically, the question is, is there something really existing there, or are these just phantasms that we experience? Is there something really there behind the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste? Is there nothing behind the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste? And the Buddha says, try to drop off. Where does that put you? It puts you in a position where you can actually experience what's arising and passing away. He says, look at it just that, as arising and passing away. As you see things arise, the idea that they don't exist doesn't occur to you. As you see them passing away, the idea that they do exist doesn't occur to you. 
you put yourself in a position where that's not the issue. The issue simply then turns into what? Turns into simply the fact there's stress arising and passing away. Whatever arises, it's a form of stress. And once you look at your experience in those terms, then the imperatives of the Four Noble Truths come in. Where there's stress, you've got to comprehend it. In other words, you look at your experiences not with the question of, is there something behind there? Is there nothing behind there? Behind there is not the issue. What you're directly experiencing, that's the issue. Try to comprehend that. Then you can see the craving that causes the stress to rise and pass away. Learn how to abandon that. Develop the path so that you can realize the ending, the cessation of stress. And this is another case where the, the middle there is off the continuum. It requires that you think in new ways. So when you find yourself with problems in the meditation, sometimes it's simply the matter of sliding back or forth on, on the continuum. Heavier effort, lighter effort. More analysis, less analysis, more quiet, less quiet. But the other times you have to get off the continuum. That requires that you use your ingenuity, learn to think outside the box. Think off the continuum. This is why some teachers like to use paradox a lot in their teachings, the unexpected answer. There's that question of Ajahn Chah we were discussing today. Ajahn Chah asks, what is the mind? His answer is, the mind isn't it is anything. It's not grammatical, but the fact that it's not grammatical is meant for you to stop and think. What does it mean? The mind isn't is anything. Or another way of translating the mind isn't a what. To alert you to the fact that sometimes we ask the wrong questions, you've got to frame the question in a new way. So when you find yourself sliding back and forth on a continuum, the extremes don't work. The middle part of the continuum doesn't work. Maybe you've got to get off the continuum. Look at what questions you're asking. Maybe it's time to reframe the question so you can get that, that other kind of middle. The middle that avoids both extremes and avoids even the middle point between the extremes. Because it's off the continuum entirely.